In today's review, we're going to talk about Shiv Audio's Point Zero Cardioid Monitor Speaker, which retail for about $6,500, no, 6,500 euro per pair. These speakers feature a six and a half inch midwoofer, a one inch dome tweeter and a waveguide, and two eight inch woofers on the side. They use a Hypix Encore amplifier with built-in DSP and a three-way design that provides about 300 watts for the sub, 200 watts for the midwoofer, and 100 watts for the tweeter. One of the questions I know I'm gonna be asked is, can you hear the tweeter hiss when you're right up next to it? This thing has a remote, you can turn the volume all the way up, and even with my ear, I would say maybe about a foot and a half away, because that's about how far I had them set up on my desktop, I didn't really hear any hissing from the tweeter at full tilt. Now that doesn't mean that in a more quiet environment that you won't hear that, but that's just in my office space in here with the standard computer fan over here running. So hope that helps. The overall performance of these speakers is pretty good. Now listen, they are no Dutch and Dutch 8C, although they do look very similar to it. As judged by the, I guess I would consider them a passive mid-range canceling slot on the side, which again, it's very reminiscent of Dutch and Dutch 8C. As far as I know, there's no patent infringement. I did look into it. So this does seem to be a legitimate design that they can provide. And the only reason I'm saying that is because I've had a couple of people actually PM me and ask me about this. They don't extend as low as the Dutch and Dutch 8C. And honestly, just aesthetically speaking, I like the 8C more. I think it just looks like a better looking speaker. But these are about half the price or maybe even a little bit less than half the price of the Dutch and Dutch 8C. So to be fair, I'm not necessarily expecting the same performance that the 8C provides me. In terms of price comparison, maybe the best comparison that you could make is to the Mesonovic CDM65. And that's a smaller cardioid design. It doesn't quite get as low as these do, but it's closer to the same price. These speakers, in my opinion, sound pretty neutral. I put them about 10 centimeters off the back wall or in the wall behind actually you right now. And I set up the bass via the Hypex DSP that you can download the software for. In doing so, I was able to kind of go through and tweak the bass and get it exactly how I wanted it to be. You'll notice that the anechoic measurements show that there's a roll off starting around 200 Hertz. I reached out to the manufacturer and I said, is this what you intended? And I was told that yes, that is what they intended because again, the speaker is a cardioid design. It is intended to be placed near a wall and that region they expect to have some boundary compensation from that rear wall and therefore it would be more flat in room. That is unlike the Dutch and Dutch 8C, which while it does have a mild roll off, it's not as extreme as these. So the Dutch and Dutch, in my opinion, seems to have more output potential as well as better linearity overall. But with these, as long as you're listening in the near field on axis with your ears placed right between the tweeter and the midwoofer, then you'll have a pretty good overall sound. The cardioid definitely does help to limit the mid-range wraparound. And the reason that you might want that is you avoid those reflections off the back wall. And in doing so, then you can put the speaker closer to the back wall and get more boundary compensation. So there's that trade-off of you get more bass by putting the speaker closer to the wall, but oftentimes with a standard monopole speaker, you'll get more reflections from the mid-range off that back wall and then come back to you in cancellation. So the mid-range may not sound as pure, if you will. But with a cardioid design, they are essentially frontward firing from 100 to 200 hertz and up. Now, the Shiv audios are claimed to be cardioid from 100 hertz and up, but according to my data, it actually doesn't fully transition to cardioid until about 200 hertz, but still, that's okay. With the lessened reflection of the rear wall mid-range, you do have a more cohesive and more coherent mid-range, if you will, and it's really hard to explain what I mean by that. I hope that if you're watching this video, you probably have an appreciation for what it's like to not have rear wall bounce, and maybe you've heard some cardioid speakers before. If you haven't, try to find some and listen to them. And I think you'll understand what I mean. If you do wind up trying to listen to these in the far field, there are a couple things that you're gonna run into. One is the 
output capability of these when they're set to full range mode. So there are three presets that you can flip between. I tested these with preset one, which is full range mode, going down to 20 hertz. Preset two will allow you to only extend down to 30 hertz, and it gives you a little bit more SPL. And then preset three extends down only to 80 hertz and gives you the most SPL. If you listen to these in preset one from maybe three or four meters out, you might run into a case where you're running into some protection limits of the speaker. I did. In my testing, I also ran into the protection limits of the speaker because I essentially set preset one for the duration of my test measurement portion as well as my test listening portion. So just keep that in mind as far as SPL goes, you might be limited and you'll wanna make sure that you use the correct preset, the one that makes the most sense. But again, when you're putting the speaker close to the wall, you do get extra boundary reinforcement. So you will get some extra bass. And you might be okay to set this in preset two. You may not need it to necessarily go down to 20 hertz. In the near field, all of that's moot though. I also noticed that they tended to sound a little bit chesty with certain vocals. Now, I'm not saying that because it was certain vocals, it wouldn't appear on everything. But most of what I noticed it on was female tracks. So Nora Jones or even Madonna. But other than that, I don't have any complaints about the overall tonality of the speaker, especially in the near field. So now let's talk about the data. All the data that you're about to see is captured using the Clipple near field scanner. It is a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic environment like you see in my garage. This allows us to separate the performance of the speaker from the room and better understand how best to use the speaker and what some of its technical faults or merits may be. First off, a reminder and an illustration. This is what I mean when I say the acoustic reference at the midpoint is between the tweeter and the mid-range right below it. So somewhere in this ballpark, and that is according to the manufacturer's specification as well. I wanted to show a quick screen grab of the Hypex DSP. Now, unfortunately, I've already boxed this thing up. I didn't think to take the time to actually do my own screen grab. So this is one I grabbed from the internet. But what I do like about this speaker is that you can plug it into your computer and you can do some equalization if you want to. And you could probably even reach out to the manufacturer about unlocking it to do some custom equalization if you'd like to. All of these were tested using preset one. As I said earlier, that's the more aggressive protection circuit version. So it will allow you to get down to 20 Hertz, but the protection circuit kicks in pretty early. That caused me issues with some of my higher output testing, which you'll see in a little bit. This is the frequency response on axis. Ignore the sensitivity because this is just scaled via math. Uh, the actual target SPL for my powered speaker testing is between about 80 to 85 decibels at one meter. So I was in that ballpark for these speakers. This is what I was talking about earlier when I said there's a roll off below about 200 Hertz, right? So there's less SPL going down into the lower frequency region. And I did email the manufacturer. I asked them, hey, is this what you intended? Is this what you expected? And they said, yes, because when you put it near a wall, you're going to get boundary gain. Now I knew that, but I was honestly surprised to see it fall down that much. I don't recall the Dutch and Dutch 8C or the Key Audio 3 or the Mesonovic that I mentioned previously having that much of a droop in the lower frequency base region. So I'm just kind of putting that out there that I did verify that this is how it's supposed to work. And I'm a little bit surprised. F3 still 31 Hertz, F10, 22 Hertz. So this speaker will get down quite low in your room. And by the time you put it near a wall, some of this stuff will kind of fill in. And if you feel like you need to, you can actually EQ it down or you can EQ for room modes with the Hypex software. Going up in frequency, we can see that everything is pretty neutral. Now this area right around 300 Hertz stands out a little bit. And I kind of wondered maybe if this is where I felt like things were a little bit cuppy or hollow, just a little bit more boomy with female vocals. I don't know for sure, and it could have very well been my room, but I do find this interesting because about 200 to about 400 Hertz is usually where a vocal region is gonna sound a little bit more boomy, and the higher end of that is gonna be more for female vocals. Aside from that, the frequency response is about plus or minus two decibels on average. Overall, pretty good. This is the CEA 2034 data set. And really what I wanted to call out here was the fact that Shiv Audio does recommend a distance from the wall between about 10 to 50 centimeters. And I found that in their manual. And that will increase the low frequency SPL down here. Another thing that I wanted to call attention to was the cardioid design. Cardioid meaning that 
it's forward firing. The rear waves are being canceled out, so nothing's really going behind the speaker. Theoretically, it doesn't happen quite abruptly as it sounds. So there's a a window as it's shifting more toward cardioid. Below about 100 hertz, most of the sound energy is going toward the side or the rear of the speaker. And that makes sense because the woofers are on the side of the speaker. As we go higher in frequency, we can see that the directivity is actually increasing. And by the time you get to about 200 hertz, you're pretty much all frontward firing. Going higher in frequency, we can see that the sound power and the early reflections directivity pretty much track each other very well. Even in the higher frequency, they both start increasing about the same, and that's because the tweeter is narrowing. But this one to two kilohertz region, there is a bump there. Now that bump is due to the distance between the tweeter and the midwoofer below it. So it's that vertical directivity that's causing you a shift there. This is the estimated in-room response. And here's a line that I've drawn, kind of give you an idea of how I heard the speaker in the room in the far field. And make sure that you're paying attention to where I say, note, this is only applicable in the far field. In the near field, these are what's going to matter. These are what you're going to hear. But in the far field, you're going to hear a mixture of the room. So if you put these speakers in a room and you're pretty far away and there's a lot of boundary reflections, you're more likely to hear something like this. In which case, there would be some lessened clarity or attack, and that's going to be due to that separation distance between the midwoofer and the tweeter. And then you're going to notice maybe a falling treble. So you'll want to make sure that you probably stay with these speakers pointed directly at you, I don't necessarily think I would tow them off axis. This is the horizontal contour plot, plus or minus 60 degrees, pretty dang good, until about three kilohertz, then you start narrowing in your radiation. This is the vertical plot, at about plus or minus 20 degrees. So this is where I'm saying that you need to make sure that you stay at that reference axis between the tweeter and the midwoofer. Otherwise, you're gonna get a pretty significant suck out through this one to two kilohertz region. Distortion at 86 decibels, and distortion at 96 decibels, a failed test. Why? Because the preset one isn't designed for the output levels that I was testing at, frankly. When I hit these speakers with a sign sweep, like I do for all of my speakers, powered or passive, oftentimes what I'll run into is some pretty strong limiting on powered speakers. And sometimes that limiting basically just mutes the speaker for the entire duration. Now, that didn't really happen with this speaker. What it did was it allowed to play the mid range through, but it muted the bass and the high frequency. And I don't really think it makes sense for me to show a test result where it just muted everything except for the mid range. So I basically considered this a no test for that SPL level and that preset one. If I tested with preset three, I might have had a result from this, but I just didn't do that because that's not how I chose to listen to them. Multi tone distortion at 70, 78, 87, and they're about 96 decibels stepping up. You can see at the highest output level, you're still below that 3% distortion. Multitone in the high frequency area looks really good as well. So there's really only some increased distortion around four to 500 Hertz. But something worth checking is when you measure distortion at a given threshold, you're targeting a specific output. You expect that if you provide an input of 0.1 volt that you might get 90 decibels. And if you provide more voltage then you're gonna get higher voltage, right? So it's often the case that these power speakers have limiters built into them where they're basically saying, I don't care how much voltage you feed me, I'm not gonna get any louder than this. So that's the other thing you have to check to make sure that when I say it's 96 decibels at 0.378 volts input, it actually is 96 decibels. And I do that by looking at this graphic. This is the compression. When I'm targeting 96 decibels, there's about a half a decibel to about a decibel of compression. So overall max SPL that I was able to get is closer to about 95 decibels. And therefore that's where this particular multi-tone distortion is. It's at 95 decibels or so. If you add a subwoofer, so let's say maybe you put this in preset three and you try to limit the excursion of the woofers, is it gonna really change anything on the mid-range? Is it gonna decrease that mid-range distortion? And in this case, no. So if I go back, this is what we have. And then with an 80 Hertz cutoff, this is what we have. So there's really no change. So it doesn't seem like the, the mid bass driver, not the woofers on the side, but the mid bass driver, mid range, isn't really benefiting from having 
a high pass filter applied to it. Really, it would just be the excursion of the woofers on the side that would probably benefit the most. And then if I run my typical sine wave sweep through the speaker, we get this and I'm not surprised. And I'm noting it, 96 decibels and 102 decibels, the protection circuit kicks in, basically mutes the speaker all except for the higher frequency. And essentially all I was able to test is 76 decibels to 86 decibels. When you're listening to music, this is more representative of what you're gonna get out of one of these speakers. But for these quick tests, you can possibly expect, depending on how loud you need to listen to, some compression or some limiting that might just very quickly mute the circuits on this speaker. Now, this is the same for many powered speakers. So keep that in mind when you're looking at my results of powered versus passive speakers. A passive speaker isn't gonna show this significant drop off. It's gonna show some waviness going on lower frequency where there's more resonances and cabinet resonances and things like that. All right, so that's my review of the Shiv Audio Point Zero. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, you know, it sounds kind of rude to say, but I guess I would consider it maybe a poor man's Dutch and Dutch HC. If you can afford the Dutch and Dutch HC, get that speaker. But if you just simply don't have the budget because this is half the price, then I think this is a, a speaker that's worth considering uh, compared to some of the other speakers that I've tested. It does get lower than that Mesonovic, but then outside of that, you know, you've got the Key 3. I haven't looked at those results in a long time, so I can't really say. And with that said, I am out. If you would like to support what I'm doing here, I would certainly appreciate it. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. Or if you want to use any of my generic affiliate links for Amazon or Crutchfield or anything else that I've got, I'll have those in the description below. I also want to note that I was not paid for this review. I'm not shilling. They sent me the speaker. I tested it, sending it back. That's it. So I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.